Welcome to the Mac Talks, everybody. I am your host, Scott Johnson. This young fella is my co-host and your co-host, Chase Hutchison. Hey, guys. Chase, do us a favor. Let our listener, listeners know and our guests know what the Mac Talks is all about. So if you're a business owner, an entrepreneur, or a community leader, the Mac Talks are the vehicle that bring you the stories that you need to hear. Yeah, we do. And today we got a great guest. Chase is going to go ahead and announce him. All right. So our guest today started with a simple t-shirt that read, I survived, in reference to three tough seasons for the New York Mets. It became a fan favorite and flourished into a full clothing line and brand known as the Seven Line Army. Today, they're a licensed MLB and New Era Caps partner with an official merch kiosk behind center field at City Field and a cult following of diehard Mets fans. It's our pleasure to have their fearless leader, Darren Meehan, on the podcast. Darren, welcome. Thanks for having me, boys. I appreciate the intro. That was very nice of you, Chase. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so uh, we love everything you're doing, man. We checked you out. Uh, Tom told us, our intern Tom told us all about you, and we're super excited to have you on and to kind of talk to you about how you're able to build this whole thing. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, Tom was... Uh, we were chatting it up at the opening day tailgate party at City Field, and uh, this sounded like something right up my alley. So I'm happy to talk to you guys. Awesome, and I'm sure Tom had 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 let you know that I'm a Phillies fan. No, he didn't actually. Oh, he I, didn't let you know. I got I got to turn this thing off. Hey, it's been nice. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny because I totally love the passion, man. I love the passion that you have because I'm the same way. You know, I grew up in Delaware. When you grow up in Delaware, it's kind of like growing up in Connecticut. It's like you're going to either go to Boston or you're going to go to New York. And, you know, in Delaware, we were either going to go to Philadelphia or we we're going to go to Baltimore. So we went to Philadelphia and those are all the teams that I kind of rooted for and stuff like that. So always love a good Mets Bills, um, you know, rivalry. Uh, it's always, it's always fun. And I just love the passion, um, especially with what you're doing and stuff. Yeah, so now, and now it kind of helps too that the, the teams are both, you know, on paper looking good again. So the Na national league East is going to be a dog fight. I think the whole season, I mean, besides the Marlins, cause they stink, but you know, <laughs> having the, having the Phillies good, having the Mets good and, and the nationals and you yeah, know, it's, it's just, fun. it's just going to be a fun time on the, in the NL East. Yeah, no, definitely a hundred percent. And I got to come clean right off the bat. I say I'm a New York fan. So oh, any God. New York teams, okay, I'm a fan of. I'm I'm more of growing up. I was a wrestling and lacrosse guy. Um, I followed a little bit of football, but I like the UFC and stuff like that. I'm more interested in the business aspect of everything. Like I, I read a lot about how you got started and everything. So I'm going to be that guy. <laughs> um, I'm going to take that role. I'm supposed to be um, Giants, Knicks. Mets. That's what I'm supposed okay. to be. I thought you were just. I thought you were just going to tell me that you're a fan of the Yankees and the Mets, which that's. that's oh yeah. No, 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 I, I don't no, play that. He wouldn't be allowed here. If no, that was I don't. The case. I don't. I'm not even going to front. Like I don't. I don't follow it. I'm a New York fan, but I, I. I love what you're doing, and and that's why we're excited to have you. That's kind of how I am with other sports as well. Like baseball's my thing. Uh, I have picked the the Jets and the Knicks and the Islanders. Uh, and you know, people are like, Oh, you're a bandwagon fan now. But like I was, I started going to the Anders games really last year. I went to a couple this year. I went to three, but I picked them before they were supposed to stink this year. Yeah. That making mm -hmm. playoffs is, you know, a big deal last night. Shout out to all the Islanders fans that, uh, kind of blew the roof off of Nassau Coliseum last night. That sounded really cool on, on, uh, on TV. The, the crowd was, was going for it last night, they but they yeah, I'm kind of just like baseball is my thing. And, and as far as everything else is, I just kind of cheer for select teams and hope they do well, you know? Yeah. The That's Islanders, the, I, I root for the uh, the Islanders. Those fans deserve, you know what I mean? Those fans deserve a little something. They've been through a lot, you know? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I always, I just, I just always felt bad for their fans just for all the stuff that they've been through and stuff. So, but yeah, so let's, let's jump in and kind of discuss a little bit about how, you know, I know Chase had mentioned in the intro, how you, you know, how you kind of sort of started Go into the details of exactly what made you kind of come about, um, you know, coming up with this idea to do the seven line. Well, I got a, a heavy BMX background, so I st I'm 30. I'm going to be 39 in November. I started racing BMX when I was 14. Before that, I raced uh, dirt bikes, motocross, mm -hmm. and um, I always appreciated the businesses that were run by other riders. So the same thing with skateboarding, like skateboard companies that are owned by other skaters, not just some big corporation that's trying to move decks or move bike frames at Toys R Us or whatever. So um, senior year of high school, 1998. St. Mary's in Manhattan on Long Island, there was an art class that uh, it was a 
was an art class where you can kind of do whatever you wanted to do. So you could pick and say, I want to paint or I want to sculpt or I want to do this or that. And I wanted to get into learning how to make T-shirts because I wanted to bring them to the races and sell them at the track. Mm -hmm. So my art teacher was awesome. Shout out to Miss Perkillo. Yeah. We're still friends now, which is awesome. That's so great. It was it wasn't for her. None, none of this would have happened. So I started making T-shirts, bringing them to races in a backpack and selling them to my fellow riders. And people really gravitated towards that type of thing because I was putting in the work. I was making the shirts myself, not, you know, not sewing the, the shirts, but printing them myself and selling yep. them at, at the races. So that was at the late 90s. Fast forward 10 years, I still had the experience of building that BMX brand, which actually grew so large where I had distributors overseas. I was selling stuff to... Uh, distributors in Japan, to places in uh, Sweden, Denmark, all over the UK. And it became a big brand. It was called Man Made. That's great. So that was the layout of, hey, this is something that I could do, kind of make my own hours, make what I want to make, not have a real job, not wear a suit and tie to work. And my parents were always very nervous that what I was applying myself to wasn't going to pan out into an actual job in the real world. <laughs> because their their idea of real world was nine to five, Suit and tie. go to college, yep. do this, do that, which there's nothing wrong with that if that's your path. But I knew at a very early age that was not my path. So I was always doing the bare minimum in school just to get by, just to pass, and, yep. and which I don't advocate. I don't suggest that that's the way you should skirt by in life. But for me, it worked. And, you know, I actually took the civil service jobs, the, the tests. I was I took the sanitation job. I took the fire department job for FDNY. And that's kind of what I was going to do. Get that 20 years in, get a retirement plan, get insurance and all that. But when this started, I was like, you know what? Maybe I could just kind of roll the dice and take my experience that I learned from the BMX brand and take that to baseball. Because at the time, 2009 is when I started the seven line. No one else was doing this. There yeah. was... There was other people making T-shirts for their favorite teams, but no one was kind of making it a brand. They were doing like, hey, I'll make a batch of funny shirts that say whatever for my Phillies fans or my Mets fans or Knicks fans or whatever. But no one was trying to do it as something where it was like an organized movement to try to bring, bring fans together. So the first shirt, like you said, in the jump was that I survived shirt, which at, at the time – I, I didn't think it was going to be a brand, but I knew that it kind of had legs where if people liked that one shirt. Maybe I could release other ones. Yep. And since – the, the collapse of 07, I think it said the collapse of 07, the DL ridden team of 08, whatever. I had like different kind of looked like a bumper yeah. stick. Like you climbed the mountain. Like I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and here's my team. <laughs> yeah. So um, fans really liked it. And the whole basis of the business in the beginning was replicating what I did for BMX and show fans that I'm making them myself and show them behind the scenes, uh, film and take photos of the whole process of me making the screens, making the shirts, doing it. And fans liked that rather than going to their local models before a game, they would come to me. So that's how it started. And yeah, that's great. Snowballed into where we are today. So that's awesome. And it, it's funny because we actually have a lot in common besides, you know, I'm extremely passionate about the, the Phillies and my Philly sports, same way you are about the Mets. Um, and also, I actually ran a screen printing embroidery and sign business for 20, oh, no way. 20 no years. Way. So you're talking screens, you're talking emulsion, you're talking, yeah, I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about and stuff. So, um, so yeah, you get to definitely be able to explore those type of things. Now, how did you... Um, like how were you able to start to sell? Were you, were you selling a lot of the shirts in the parking? You're selling a lot of shirts in the parking lot. You're doing some parking networking lot. in the stadium, just kind of building your brand. Yeah. I lived so close to the ballpark at the time nice. where I, I was at every game. Yep. So I knew at the beginning if I wanted to do this and actually make it a job, I had to be there all the time. So when I first started the, the shirts, there wasn't even a website up yet. So we're talking 09. So like Instagram wasn't even a thing yet. I yep. didn't have Twitter. I had a Facebook page, but everything was word of mouth and um, just trying to put out a great product that people wanted to talk about and tell their friends about because it was all word of mouth. I still to this day, we're 11 seasons later. I've never paid to advertise, not even a dollar. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, Besides, I do randomly uh, promote Facebook posts because Facebook sucks now and it doesn't show your you audience. Get to your, yeah, you have to get to your organic you following. Pay. Yeah. Yep. 
we have like, I don't know, it's like 60,000 likes on the Facebook page, but we'll post something that has like a time. If I write like, hey, watch our show tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern, it won't show anyone. Yeah, because so it, you have to boost it. Yeah. That you're, that you're promoting something. So Facebook sucks. So Yeah, I hate that. I hate that they did that. It's like, just it, let us it, have our own, fa- let us be able to push it to those people alone. Like we work so hard to get them, you know? So Yeah, well, you know, that is what it is. Mark Zuckerberg, you know, if you watch the social network, what he started it as clearly isn't it what it is today. But I don't blame him. I mean, it's Yeah, it's exactly. A business, exactly. So, anyway, so yeah, it just grew from word of mouth. And, um, you know, making those first few shirts that people liked, I was like, you know what, maybe I could do this as a business. I started the site, started making postcards, business cards, handed things out at the So ballpark. you're just walking around the, the, you know, the parking lot, just networking with people, yeah. talking, and then, and McFadden, then you just got to know everybody. and Yeah, yeah. And then when McFadden's opened, um, I know the one in Philly, I think, just closed. But when the McFadden's opened at City Field, I made you know, strong relationships with the bartenders and with the, uh, the management there. And the Mets didn't like this at the time, but I was actually setting up certain days where I would set up a table in the bar and sell in the bar. But then the Mets were like, Hey, this is our property. You can't really be selling shirts in McFadden's because I didn't have the license then. I was yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Whatever. But I wasn't, I wasn't breaking any trademark laws. I wasn't writing Mets. You weren't I putting logos. Right, yeah, right. yeah. 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 And anything I ever did that had to do with the player's likeness, I would get permission from the player. So, um, and you have, stuff. you have some affiliation with players as well. Cause I know that you guys, you know, they, they give you guys a lot of props out there and you know, it yeah, yeah, seems yeah, like you guys totally. have an awesome relationship with the players. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and in the beginning it was, you know, we were making some stuff that they necessarily, not that, that, that they couldn't wear, but they, they probably shouldn't have worn because it was a little kind of on the edgy side. Yeah. But when we started working with guys like R.A. Dickey and Johan Santana started wearing some of the shirts and Ike Davis and, nice. uh, uh, Kirk no, no one knew how to spell Kirk Neuenheis. So it said Kirk and then like a bunch of different, no, no, it, it had, uh, his last name spelled wrong like five times with X's through it. And they just said, <laughs> Kirk. No one knows. <laughs> so like stuff like that, the guys thought was funny and they wanted to support their, their fellow teammates. So they would wear them in the clubhouse. And for me, it was such a thrill. Cause I'd, I would seriously drop shirts off right to the side of the ballpark. I would set it up through Instagram or, or actually at the time, Twitter DMS. I'd be like, Hey guys, I got some shirts. They would personally come to the side door of the stadium, the players at the door and just open it up. I'd walk in with a box of shirts and wow. like, holy shit, I can't believe, I, sorry if I, I don't know if I can No, you can, it's cool, no, it's cool. Like, uh, holy crap, like, I can't believe I'm in, inside the building with the players and it's crazy. Like, I love it. I think it's such it a... It certainly helped propel it to the next level because at the time I still didn't have the license with MLB. Yeah, so obviously all of that helped you with getting the licensing for a lot of reasons. Number one, I mean, you have, yeah, to, pay, you have to pay for the licensing to a certain extent, well, right? Yeah. So it gave you the capital. <laughs> yeah, and then it also gave you the credibility. Like they're like, "Well, we better give this guy some license because he knows what he's doing." You well, know, yeah, so. you know what it is too. I think the Mets. I don't want to put words in their mouth. They've never came out and said this, but I think the Mets saw that even though I was ruffling a lot of feathers in the beginning, I think they they saw that deep down I had a good head on my shoulders, and this was a good thing for not only them because I was buying a shitload of tickets, but the players, the players' morale. I mean, they liked it. the The fans liked it, and when it came time to getting the license. Uh, in 2014, I think that everything that led up to that, we were doing a lot of charity work. I was, I was doing a lot, um, of right, even though I was kind of pissing them off on, on some other stuff, but I think I was doing a lot of right with it and, um, certainly having a relationship with the players helped. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so real quick for all of our listeners and some of them may not be aware. So could you just explain what the seven lane, uh, seven line army means? Well, seven line army is the group of us. The brand is just the seven line. So it's, um, the number seven, T-H-E, the number seven, L-I-N-E. And the seven is the train that runs through Queens. It's the one that stops at the ballpark. In 2009, when I was trying to come up with a name, people call a clothing company, sometimes a clothing line. So there was a few meanings to it. The seven train, the seven line, line meaning a clothing line. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jose Reyes, one of my favorite players, wore number seven. So there was a lot of connections there. And it kind of just worked out where the name stuck And I tell this all the time to people who are starting businesses and I'm glad I thought of this or even had this, um, you know, this rule in my head 11 years ago was make sure all of your names match. So even for you guys like Mac media, uh, short at Mac media or Mac media.com matches. So the seven line.com was available. So I locked it up right away on Facebook. When I got a Twitter account, I made it on Twitter. When I got Instagram, I made it on Instagram. So I made sure everything was available. And a lot of, some of the things I was looking up for names beforehand wasn't. So I was like, Metropolitan Tees, uh, is that available? And like, no, actually someone already had that. So I wanted to make sure what I named it 
was going to be available across the board. Um, and I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, sounds like you've always kind of had this entrepreneurial spirit to you kind of going back to, so. you know I what mean, I mean? He, being the BMX stuff. And, yeah. But even when I'm like 10 years old, yeah. I bought a shovel and go shovel. No one even shovels snow, snow anymore. Like, no, I know. <laughs> no one rings my bell. I'm out there doing my driveway on my own. But you know, I feel like I've always been trying to make a, make a little scratch on the side and I've had a billion jobs. I worked at Toys R Us. I worked at 7-Eleven. I worked at a flower shop. I work at a bike shop. I, I worked at a country club, uh, flipping burgers in the snack bar. This so is I've one had of those a, things, uh, you know, your career and this is one of those things of doing what you like and it's not work. Right. Yeah, like you don't, <laughs> I mean, I'm just looking at you and I see your setup. It looks awesome. You got your bobbleheads. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you probably have such an amazing time when you go to the games, you know, so many people it's like, does it feel like work? I, it's, it is. I, I say this a lot. It, it's, I feel like I don't have a job, but it is still a lot of work because I'm responsibility. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm always thinking about like, I'm writing myself notes like, all right, after this interview, like I got to order shirts because I got to I got to do something tomorrow. I get there's always something going on. Like tonight we got our show at six o'clock. So I got my own show prep for tonight. Like there's always something going on. And you would think like, oh, off season, he got probably gets to chill a little bit in uh, October, November, December. And it's not it's it's I work more in the off season, I think, than during the season, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, right. I'm working on the next year's outings, depending on where we're going to bring the group the product that we have to come out for the holiday season, getting ready for Black Friday. Like there's really no off season when you're running a brand. And I only have one other full time employee. Yeah. So it's I do a lot on my back. So it's like even this stuff, like learning how to do the set and the studio and the video editing and the social media and the designing and the website and the image. I do all that. I yeah. do yep. all that. so like I don't hire anyone to do the little jobs that I know I can handle. Yep. And, and I don't think that that's a bad thing. I suggest that to any or entrepreneur or anyone who's trying to start their business, don't hire too many people because if you could figure out how to do it on your own, you save a lot in payroll. Um, you could certainly get past that five year mark where a lot of businesses fail within the first five years. Yep. And, um, you know, now only having one other full-time employee, we juggle a lot, but we make it work because, if I would have, let's say 2015 prime example, World Series, we're in the World Series. We're working around the clock, making sure that we get our orders out. Uh, my wife was working with our one-year-old daughter. <laughs> on her, like, on her Strapped to her chest. Yeah, yeah, with the- Everyone was working. The sweatshirts were piled to the ceiling and it was all hands on deck. But let's say I hired like four extra people to, to take care of that. Then in 2016, when the Mets start shitting the bed again, I got to lay people off. And, you know, it just makes a lot more sense for us to have like, two full timers and a few part timers like ready to go whenever we need them yep. rather than commit too much right off the bat, you know? Yeah, no, that's awesome. And you were starting to mention some of the things that you guys do, like the trips and stuff. Like, tell us, tell us about what it's like to be a part of the, you know, the 700, uh, the seven line army. Oh man, it's, we're working on Kansas city right now. That goes up next week. And how many that, do you go? How many usually a year do you go on? Um, it's usually about, about, uh, four or five this year, we're doing three because we canceled Chicago. That's a whole nother thing in itself. There's some controversy with that, but our hundredth outing was supposed to be in Chicago in June. And we had, we had to cancel it, unfortunately. So, yeah. um, we moved it to back to city field. That's going to be our hundredth outing, uh, in June at city field, which is going to be awesome. But the road games are incredible because we show up and the home fans and the locals in the cities, when we're walking through the, the town have no idea what this is. They get so confused. They see a thousand people wearing a matching t-shirt cheering for the opposite team. We'll go <laughs> the streets and you guys and- all sit together. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's unbelievable. always travel together. Everybody moves together, right? Like stay in the yeah, same yeah, hotel. Yeah. Like it's all done through, like through you. Like you book. No, no, no. But, how does that work? What we actually do. We tell people they're responsible for their own travel and their own hotel accommodation. Some people want to ball out and stay at you know yeah, okay. some hotel. Yep. Others want to you know just rough it and stay in a hostel. So we don't plan that. We do suggest hotels if we get a block somewhere. But typically, we really just offer them. The seat to the game, the special event T-shirt. We always give out a patch that comes with, with it, where it's, it'll say like Kansas City and the date. So if you have the jersey, you can iron it onto your pat, onto your jersey. Awesome. And uh, this year, what we're doing in Kansas City because it's so freaking hot in August in Kansas City. There's no shade in that parking lot. They uh, the Royals are really cool about tailgating. They totally embrace it. So they dedicated an area that holds. It's going to hold all of us. So we have 1,400 tickets to that game, and they're giving us the space to tailgate for for free. But we have to rent 
uh, supplies. So there's a company they actually, it's really brilliant. Like, there's a company they work with that rents tailgate supplies. So we're getting a 40 by 80 tent, a bunch of tables, a bunch of chairs. I'm hiring a DJ. Oh, so that's we're awesome. Pay, yeah, it's going to be sick. So that's all part of the cost of buying the package, which is only 63 bucks. So you're getting the tailgate party. You're that's getting the t-shirt, you're getting the ticket to the game. You're getting the patch. Um, the funny so we we come together and have fun, you know? The funny thing is about that is, like, there is no, like, nobody in Kansas City. That's going to be the best part, like, you know, the best party going on in the parking yeah. lot. Yeah, I And you so. guys aren't even, like, they're going to want to be in your party. <laughs> That's what's funny. They're going to be like, oh, man, look, they're really showing. It's what it is, is you're showing, you're showing almost, uh, you're almost showing them out, like, to a certain extent. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think it's, I think it's awesome. Yeah. But I try to lead by example, too. You know, a lot of people think like, oh, you guys call yourself an army. You guys try to look for trouble. And it's it's going to be further from the truth. Like we'll go to outings and certainly we cheer for the team. And, you know, we try to be as respectful as we can with our cheers. We're not, you know, we'll boo the other team, but we're not we're not being yeah. abrasive. Having or, fun with you know, it. Yeah, exactly. And, and when the game is over, we high five the other fans. You know, we oh. were in Atlanta and we're walking out and yep. we lost. The, the Mets actually we there's a few outings that stick out in my mind where we were winning. Until late in the game, the Mets bullpen freaking blew it. And then it's like the whole ballpark turns on us. Because, yeah. like, we're cheering together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're, we're in, which is crazy, too, because you're, you're in their brain or in their ear so much for, like, the first eight innings where you're dominating the ballpark. And we were – the first time this happened, we were in San Francisco in 2014. I think it was familiar. Somebody blew it in the ninth inning. And the whole ballpark turned around to boo us. Yeah. Or, like, you're like, like oh, I mean, you know. Like, that's got like, to feel so great because it's it like – It does. I, I mean, I, I certainly want the Mets to win. But – it's funny when they turn around and like they all turn on us. But when the game's over, we all high five. And if we're at a bar afterwards, we're cheers. In, and it's just about fun. And I think yeah, I'm the same. Like can, anything you could do to bring fans together and have a good time is cool in my book. And, you know, you only live once and you should enjoy it as much as possible. And that's what we try to do. Yeah. No. And I it's funny because exactly what you said, like I'm die hard Philly, like die hard. And I exactly what you just said. Like I'll high, like I love it. It's fun. It's like the fun of going back and forth and doing that. But I do you know what you're saying. Rap, though. I mean, I'm not going to lie. There's there's been a lot of circum circumstances with Phillies, Phillies and Eagles fans I who do, do go over the line. And you know what? I'm not saying that all Mets fans are angels. Like it's tough that you guys all get pa painted in the same brush. But you know, there's a lot of scummy people in your fan bases. But oh yeah, um, yep. You know, there there is in ours too. And you know, it's. A lot of people say, um, you know, you know, for some people, to be completely honest, they say, oh, the Seven Line Army, uh, they aren't welcoming, even though I think we are. Maybe they've had a bad experience with the one of thousands of members. Who exactly. Yep. And it's hard to say that, like, everyone is, is uh, you know, unified in the same thought of what this is. And I, I certainly always try to go on the record and be like, we don't think we're better fans than any other Mets fan. We just like to cheer together and that's our thing and if you like it cool and if you don't you want to like keep score and be quiet in your own section that's cool too so um yeah there's always bad eggs in every fan base but i feel like the phillies fans they they go over the edge i oh, it's just yeah a story not to talk no about, no talk, no go ahead because i'll tell you another one too where we go down to philly i think it was 2000 i don't know 2013 or so uh, it was one of the first games of the season. John Roush, I became friends with him. He was one of the ex-Mets pitchers. Yep. He was only there for a couple of years. But I he left a couple of tickets for my wife and I to go watch the Phillies, Phillies versus Mets down in Philly. So I tell my wife on the way down, I'm like, listen, it's a little sketchy down here. Let's that talk. That, that talk that you have. <laughs> yeah, try not to mouth off. Like if anyone <laughs> says anything stupid, just kind of laugh it off. She's like, all right. So I, I don't even know if the Mets won or lost that day. But we're walking back to the car. And my wife goes, "What? Well, that wasn't too bad. Like no one, no one did anything rude. And then the next thing you hear is fuck the Mets. And someone <laughs> throws a bottle, a glass bottle. And it, it landed like not that close to us, but close I'm like, enough. I'm like, wow, like uh, that couldn't have been timed any more perfectly that she's like, ah, oh, it was, oh, it was that wasn't too bad. And next thing you yeah. know, we're getting like pelted with a glass bottle. But exactly. It, right. It, it, you know, it is what it is. No, I know. And those type of people, like, they're so, like, I don't get that. Like, I get going back and forth and having fun with it. But, 
you know, to go that far where you throw something like that, that's, that's just a little bit, that's just a little bit too much. Like for me, I love it. I like to go back and forth. I remember one time I was at, I was at Shea and it's funny because the higher up you sit, the worse it gets. And yeah, of I'm working. The cheaper walk- the seats get, the more rowdy you get. Yeah, I'm walking up with my buddy. So all my friends are all Mets fans. You know what I mean? Obviously. So I always go, and I'm the, you know, I'm with a bunch of Mets fans and my Philly stuff, and we're walking up, and I'm carrying. My buddy is carrying like four beers, and I'm carrying an iced tea, and somebody just screams from across, like, "Hey, Phillies fan, nice iced tea!" Like <laughs> it, it was just funny. Like it was just so stupid, but it was so funny. Um, yeah. you know. So, but I know those types that you're talking about. I mean, when when the Phillies didn't make the playoffs. For, you know, from I think it was 91 until I think it was 07 against Colorado when they finally made it. Right. So the game was at three. I end up just getting there just in time. I come inside. I mean, literally by the second inning, two Phillies fans beat the shit out of each other. Like, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, we haven't been like that. They've been down there since eight o'clock in the morning. Probably yeah, they yeah. did not go to work that day. It's basically a holiday. The Phillies made it back into the playoffs. And uh, it was just like. I see so much Philly on Philly <laughs> crap that happens that I, I can't attempt to understand it. So it's yeah, not even it, just the other fans. It's to each other, too, sometimes, yeah, yeah, it's which is just, it's just too much. But um, but yeah, so I wanted, me, to, uh, I wanted to actually ask really quickly um, what it was like when you guys shut down traffic in uh, San Diego when you guys were at the outing there. Oh, that was incredible. Like I was Tell talking about, about that. before how like no one knows what the hell to do when we show up. We were at the McFadden's in, in San Diego and I set it up. I, I had relationship with uh, McFadden's at City Field. So I had the managers link us up with um, the San Diego McFadden. So we get there and I always tell them, listen, guys, be prepared for war. We're going to show up. There's going to be a lot of people there. Make sure your bartenders are ready to go. Yeah. And luckily, they actually, they were pretty prepared in San Diego. A lot of times they're not. Specifically last year, Boston, we went to a bar before and then they were not ready. It was, I wanted to jump behind the bar and start working, to be honest. Yeah, that's but, because you guys um, a lot of you are coming in at once, like be prepared. <laughs> like, they're, they're never, they never listen. Yeah, and, yep. I, like, listen, we got a tra- good track record. We've been doing this a long time. You you know here are some references if you want to ch- check with the other bars. But yeah. anyway, we had a really fun time at the McFadden's in San Diego. The 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 DJ was really cool. He was playing like a lot of New York style music, like things that were going to like cater to our crowd because we took over the whole place. So when it was time to go, usually before we leave, I get in the mic and I you know I welcome everyone and I say you know try to make sure that everyone knows once we get out in the street, don't act like a dick, don't yeah. make us bad, don't get arrested, don't flip cars over. This isn't a riot. We're just walking to the stands the, yeah. to the stadium. <laughs> So we get out front and with that many fans walking, it was like a two lane street. It wasn't like a city. It was a city street for San Diego, but it's not built like Manhattan or whatever. So we get outside and it just shut down. They, they, the cars couldn't go. It was just, it, it, we weren't doing it on purpose, but there was no place for cars to go. So we start walking down the street and we didn't care about traffic signs. We didn't care about red lights. We just went and it was a parade through the, through the streets and the, the police uh, I remember a couple guys that were like um, cops on bicycles, like bicycle cops, whatever. They stopped and they were just like taking photos of us and high fiving <laughs> people. They didn't even care. <laughs> so laid back. It was unbelievable. Um, you know, and no one was mad at us. Nobody was like beeping. If it was New York. Oh, or people would have been flipping whatever, out. Would, like, get the fuck out of the street. But I'm trying to go to work. You know, somebody would uh, be trying to push through <laughs> with their car. You know how they yeah. get through. The, yeah. They loved it. They were they were hanging out of the windows, taking pictures. It was it was unbelievable. And uh, at the time, we were actually filming a documentary all about the group for uh, Sports Illustrated. It came out the season right after that. It's called Loyal, Loyal to the Last Out. It's on their uh, subscription service now on uh, I think it's on. Uh, SI.TV. You could search for it there if you guys want to watch it. But yeah. so they were filming and they were there for that. So they captured that whole thing. And it was a really just surreal experience. Steven, look back at it now. Like I kind of almost blacked out during it. It's like, yeah. you, ever, you ever seen um, uh, Talladega Nights? Uh, not a ta- with Talladega Nights. He doesn't know what to do with his hands <laughs> during the interview. Yeah. But in uh, old school, when uh, Frank the Tank is asked that question and he, and he rattles off the perfect answer and he's like, it's like, oh, oh, what happened? I just blacked out. <laughs> <laughs> I feel sometimes after these outings because it's I'm, I'm watching it and I'm like, wow, you know, I helped organize this thing and it, and people are going off and they're having fun and they're having a good time. And I'm just a spectator toward to it as well, because once it starts going, yeah, it just goes. No, yeah. And I'm not really 
organizing anything. I'm just watching, and it's yeah. You get you get the snowball going, but then it builds and it it's yeah, rolling. Yeah. <laughs> You're not that's stopping it. I am too in in the stands. Like people expect, like oh, super fans are usually crazy. They're painting their face and they're they're leading the chance and they're putting people on their shoulders, like Fireman Ed at uh, Jets games and shit like that. Yep. I've never I've never really been that guy. I mean, I'm I've tried to be as loud as I can. I don't really have a, a great <clears throat> great voice. Uh, I try to be as loud as I can, but I kind of just. Get the people together and then let it let the madness ensue, you know? Yeah. Yep. You're going to go. Yeah. Yeah. I Well, since it is a business based podcast, I like to kind of touch on a few business points uh, here and there when we can. Although I love to hear the stories as well. But yeah, uh, sorry, I, I ramble a lot. I'm sorry. No, it's I OK. It. No, it's, it's totally great. fine. I'm, it's my job to be kind of the, the conductor with this. But um, so it started with a press that you bought on eBay, right? And you stuck it in your parents' basement like a yeah. good son. And you <laughs> opened up all the windows, um, you know, when you were printing, it was kind of hard to breathe in there. So I want to- Spray tack everywhere. <laughs> yep, yep. So, so back then, I mean, compared to now, like, like how many t-shirts, let's just say t-shirts, um, but it could be caps or whatever. How much, how many products or merchandise were you, were you churning out back then in the earlier, early days when you first started? Compared to now when you're really like, for example, like now the season started and, you know, like what kind of numbers were you doing back then in terms of just how many T-shirts you're able to get out of there? Well, you know, I, I, I had a lot of experience. So I, like when I started, I was already like 10 years into screen printing or more, actually. So I was a pretty fast worker. It was all laid out in a way where the the press and the dryer and like the whole area, I used every inch of that basement. So there really was no room to have more than just me down there at any given time. But I could print at the time, maybe like, I don't know, 50, 60 shirts an hour, depending on if, how many colors were in there. Um, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. At the time, you know what it was too? It's, it's tough to talk numbers because in the beginning, the fan base or the people who knew about us wasn't that large. So yeah. I would make a couple dozen shirts and see how they sold. And some shirts that I see now, there was one, Ol Oliver Perez, who actually I'm surprised he's still pitching. Uh, yeah. It was one of the early shirts. It says Ollie for ball boy because he stunk. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. and I saw one of those recently and I'm like, holy shit, there's like 18 of those shirts. Yeah. You know, there's not wow. any. Limited now, edition. <laughs> yeah. When we set up a job now, uh, minimum of any t-shirt design is like 300. Uh, just of, which doesn't still doesn't sound like a lot, but we test the market. So a lot of people wonder, well, why do you make such a low amount? And it's because, um, you know, injuries happen, things, things change, like a player shirt sometimes could flop. Uh, a guy could go on the DL or get traded or whatever. So a player shirt's really tough to sell. That's why I don't have that many on the site. Yep. But, um, you know, 300 or so shirts at a time, same thing with hats, uh, except for that home run apple beanies, those we've sold thousands and thousands of those hats. We can't keep them in stock, <laughs> but it's all kind of done on purpose. It's supply and demand. Like if, if the home run apple beanie was always available, we would have sold, you know, a third of what we've sold. But since we only release them once a year or twice a year, people know that if they want them, this is your chance to get it. And then they, if they miss out, they got to wait a full year. So um, numbers That's wise, great. it's really tough to tell. But, you know, I would just do a couple dozen here or there, see what see what worked. And then the first real big popular shirt was the uh, Don't Trade Reyes shirt in 2011. Yep. Yeah. So the orange <laughs> shirt just said Don't Trade Reyes on it. That was huge. We sold thousands of those. And uh, what I was doing too, I would, I started a thing where I would bring the signs to the ballpark and I was getting a lot of traction on that. I got, I actually got ejected from the ballpark once uh, for my sign on uh, a Sunday, Sunday night ESPN game. I had my website on the, on the sign, which I, I, is not allowed. So um, what I would, was <laughs> doing after that was if you would make your own don't trade Reyes sign to bring to a game, I would send you a free shirt. Oh my gosh. So, People would start bringing them to <laughs> Philly. That's the Philly, genius, man. Philly Mets or Braves versus Mets. They were popping up all over Major League Baseball whenever the Mets would show up, and then I would just send them free stuff. So they were like my street team. Yeah. You know, it, was, it was great. So numbers-wise, I mean, yeah, that kind of is what it is now. We make like 300 or so per shirt when we're, when we're first testing the market, see what's popular, and then up the numbers going forward after I see what's – What's shaking, you know? Yeah. Do you use automatic or you're using manual or automatic? Now it's automatic. Back then I was doing every single shirt by hand yeah. by myself. Well, for the first, uh, your triceps were much, your triceps were much bigger back then. 
Yeah, actually, I've got surgery. You remember? You, <laughs> you know, though, when you're pushing that, when you're pushing that manual, bro, right? The carpal tunnel and then the, your triceps. I used to always crack jokes about it when you're swinging that manual around. Dude, it's not in I, my wrist. I still, I still have a hard time. Like my penmanship sucks. I had surgery on my wrist in uh, 2000 and. I don't know. I'm really bad with years. I think it was around 2013, right after opening day. I was printing so many shirts that yeah. my wrist, that I had a, I got a ganglion cyst. There's yep. a void between your tendons or something and it filled up and I had to get it removed. And the doctor was like, listen, this is probably going to come back. Uh, and it did. And now I, now I have this giant bump on my wrist, but it's from printing. I was, you know, especially when you're like, when you win the manual. Yeah, definitely. I don't expect everyone to know this, but when you're trying to lay down like a heavy coat of white, like you're really yeah, yeah. pulling that screen and it's, oh, yeah. it's a lot of work. No, yeah, you need that. You get that your core. Yeah, like you get that 80 durometer, that 60 durometer, <laughs> uh, you know, on the squeegee. These guys are like, what the hell are these dudes are these talking about? Saying. We literally could have a full on conversation just about screen printing. So. <laughs> it's a workout. It's a workout, man. And uh, you, it's, it's, a, it's tough, man. And I'm in pretty good shape, I feel like. But like I would be sore after like a long day of printing. You yeah, know? It's, it's crazy. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, all right. So before we actually get to one one question from Tommy, the intern, before we do that, who set this awesome interview up, I wanted to quickly just very quickly, just because you're diehard Mets, I'm diehard Phillies. Let's have a quick discussion about some of the players that switched back and forth. So the original, obviously, in, in my era, I would think it would be yours as well. Lenny Dykstra, right? That was the yeah. probably the biggest name you think that played for both um best career probably yeah i mean probably and you know he was a better player for you guys than us yeah. you know that's when that's, he really started to get the juice going like he really horrible. got the juice going when he got <laughs> yeah. to philly yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really, like, taking the juice and getting the juice going for you guys yeah but yeah i mean nails is a great player i don't need were, were we recording we were talking about him before no right no I don't, yeah no we weren't no we weren't yeah, he's recording. crazy uh, lenny dykes was insane yeah but now, the way that he portrays himself now, especially social media and stuff like that, like uh, on our show, when the whole thing with him and Ron Darling came out recently, I said something like I almost kind of feel bad for the guy um, because of how like where his life has turned turned out to be these days. You know, yeah. I kind of feel bad for him. But, um, yeah, I think that's probably going to that's probably one of the the biggest regrets as far as a guy that left the team and, and went to the Phillies. I mean, we've had a lot of turnover from Mets to Yankees where guys have then thrown no hitters for the Yankees. Like yeah, oh, that's tough. Yeah. It, it cone and stuff like that. But, yeah, I think for Mets, Phillies got to be nails. Yeah, I think uh, I think it was Juan Samuel that was in that. That was in. It was funny because I actually liked Dykstra when he played for the Mets. Like the, the Mets that I liked growing up were Dykstra and Howard Johnson. I liked those guys, even though I hated the Mets. <laughs> I liked yeah. those guys. Um, another thing I thought that was really funny that happened was I don't know if you remember, but um, you guys traded Turk Wendell to us, right? And it was like I think it might have been in the middle of the series or like literally like the night before. And then it's a game in extra innings, and then we bring him in, and he throws yeah. a meatball that you guys that you, you guys had a walk off. Basically, you gave us your pitcher, and then he gave you a walk off the next Hell day. Yeah, was, Do you remember was, that or no? No, I don't remember that. Oh my it, gosh, it was Turk, absolutely Turk hilarious. Turk Wendell, he was he was he was one of a kind. That guy was so. All right, so Darren, thank you so much. But before we go. We're going to have Tommy come and do a quick question because he's a diehard Mets fan and he did so awesome for setting this up. I think Tommy did. Did you actually give him the day off to go to the game or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He was supposed to work and he uh, he was like, I'm going to the Mets game and I'm going to I'm going to lock down this podcast. And we're like, go do it, brother. Do it. <laughs> yeah, he did it. He did. It. He got yeah, done. Yeah. Sorry. Right, here you go, Tommy. Right. I'm going to bring a chair. Actually, it's not like yeah. All right. The guest question would have to be, are you planning the outing yet for when the Mets retire the number 20? Um, retire the number 20. Oh, you're yeah. talking about Alonzo? <laughs> 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 I'm, like, well, I'm like, 20? What the hell are you talking about? Um, yeah, I mean, this guy's off to an insane start, right? I mean, who would have thought that? I mean, honestly, like I, I was very high on Pete Alonzo. I'm glad that the Mets did the right thing in my eyes and a lot of fans' eyes to bring him up. You can't worry about 2025 service time in 2019. This guy's helping now. He's helping win now and help the team win now. And the games in April, especially against your division rivals, matter just as much as the games in September. And getting off to a hot start, I mean, granted, it didn't work great for them last year. The Mets were 11-1, and and look what happened last year. But um, the Mets are playing Atlanta tonight. They're playing the Phillies next week. I'm glad that this guy's doing his thing. And you, you know what? It's too early to talk about rookie of the year and all these other things. It's only the second week of the season, but 
if this guy keeps it up, he's definitely going to be in the contention, or at least his name will be in the in the running for rookie of the year. But let's let's not get ahead of ourselves. But yeah, I mean, I'm very excited about him. I think he's doing great. He's doing all the right things. He seems like a great teammate, especially with how he's acting or how he was the first few games with him and, and Dom Smith kind of embracing each other after big moments. And they've kind of showed that even though they are in a competition for that first base job, that they're both team players and it's great to see, you know? Awesome. Kind of, uh, real quick, if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead, man. I got that, even though they're the same position, that Jose Ray is David Wright vibe when they hugged each other in Miami. Oh, yeah, yeah, run. yeah, that for sure. Sweet. No, for sure. I mean, unfortunately, they, they oh, probably both, yeah. won't have long careers with the team because they both play the same position. But unless Dom wants to move to left field, I mean, they tried him out there last year, but I don't know if that's going to be a spot where he could play consistently. But if these guys are both on the team for a long time, that would be great to see. Yeah. Um, anything that makes the team better, you know? And I, and I already bought the, the Alonzo jersey. I don't buy a lot of jerseys, but I already got the Pete Alonzo jersey. So I'm high on the dude. I hope I hope it works out. It's uh, it's part of the Mets fan nature to drink the Kool Aid too quickly, you know. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> we gotta take what it, we can get. So if there was Kool Aid in this fridge, I'd be drinking it every day. <laughs> so I'm, I'm already full blood, full no. go on that. So. <laughs> yeah, we gotta definitely. Maybe we'll maybe we'll meet you down there for uh for one of those Phillies games. Maybe I'll take uh I'll take Tommy. And we'll meet you down. It'll just be me coming in and saying a quick hello. I'll meet you in the I'll meet you in the uh you know in the in the walkway there though just to say what's up to you. Um, <laughs> what did they do with that McFadden? Is that new? bar there or what i'm not really sure um i'm not some sure some phillies fan you are Come yeah on. yeah i haven't been down i'm gonna go down um first i'm gonna catch some sixers playoff games i think and then uh and and then i'm gonna and then i'm gonna get down to some philly i i see more phillies games at you know at city field than i do down yeah. there you know I mean, all my family is down there and stuff but it's almost like if I go down there, I just want to go see the game and come back, and then I get shit for like, oh, you're not gonna come see us. You know what I mean? So <laughs> where's the studio? Where you guys record from? Uh, we're in Connecticut. Uh, oh, we're cool, right cool. outside of uh, right outside of Danbury. So oh, awesome. one other Mets name, Mets Phillies name, Rico Baronia. Yeah. So he <laughs> actually talk, huh? from Connecticut, right? Well, I could do this all day. You're gonna be getting you're gonna be getting emails from me later. So he's actually from Connecticut. And then he played for the Mets, which was awesome. Then he went to Philly and was banging out, you know, ninety five hundred RBI years. But then he had that, uh, he had that disease or something within his hips or something. But, uh, but yeah, it's always funny to, uh, it's always funny to, um, to think about those guys that switch back and forth. So yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but listen, man, I, we really want to, you know, keep connecting with you, keep supporting you. We're gonna put out a bunch of stuff about what you guys do, about you, um, and we want to, you know, we want to grow with you guys, and you know, and keep building this relationship, you know? Awesome. Uh, so, well, they, thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. it yeah, fun. so I'm going to have Chase go ahead and uh, close us out. All right, thanks for joining us, everybody. And if you're looking to learn more about Darren and the Seven Line Army, you can visit their website at www.thesevenline.com. Follow them on Instagram, at The Seven Line. Facebook and YouTube, just search The Seven Line. Darren, thanks so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Darren, thanks, thanks buddy. Take care. All right, signing off. <laughs>